Hey folks, thanks for tuning in to another edition of BevNet's Elevator Talk live stream. I'm Ray Latif, the editor and producer of BevNet's Taste Radio podcast, the number one podcast for the food and beverage industry. As always with the Elevator Talk live stream, we're gonna spend the next hour speaking with entrepreneurs from across the food and beverage industry about their innovative and disruptive brands. Joining me as a co-host for this episode is Tom Spear, the founder and managing partner of Boulder Food Group. Tom, how are you? Great. Thank you so much for having me today, Ray. Thank you so much for joining me. It's uh, great to see you. How are things in Boulder? Yeah, things, things are reasonably good here, uh, all things considered. Um, just, uh, yeah, like all of us, you know, adjusting to the current world situation. But, uh, uh, you know, we're feeling you know, lucky to be... Uh, in a space and working in, a, in an environment where people are still have demand for the type of products that we tend to uh, support and invest behind. For sure. Uh, you touched on what you guys do. Boulder Food Group, uh, you guys have been around for some time uh, working with a, a bunch of really emerging and interesting and innovative brands. Can you tell us a little about the formation of the firm and uh, some of the brands you're invested in? Yeah, I'd be happy to. So uh, we launched the firm in 2014. Uh, we're currently investing out of our second fund and total assets under management are a little bit over 160 million today. Uh, we've made approximately 20 investments since inception. Most of those investments have been in food and beverage related concepts, all consumer products, though we recently have expanded a little bit some investments in areas like household cleaning and beauty. Uh, though we do, you know, our, our hallmark really still is, uh, you know, focused on food and beverage. Uh, on the beverage side, a few of the notable investments we've made include Chameleon Cold Brew, Malk Organics, and Olipop. Very cool. Uh, on the food side? Uh, sure. On the food side, we've made some uh, terrific investments in companies like Cauliflower, which is the largest uh, cauliflower-based frozen pizza company in the country, and also a brand called uh, Birch Benders, which is uh, the fastest-growing pancake and waffle concept in the country today. You know, interestingly enough, we featured, uh, I think, nearly every one of those brands on uh, Taste Radio. Uh, you've been featured on Taste Radio as well. Taste Radio Insider, episode 25. The title of the episode is, How to Get This $100 Million Fund to Invest in Your Brand. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a nice title. But um, in short, uh, you know, how do you get brands to, uh, how, do you, how do you think about investing in brands? At what stage of development? are you investing in and what's the size of your typical investment? Yeah, so, so we try to be pretty flexible and uh, a lot of the experience of my, my own personal experience as well as that of my partners is from the early stages. So we do like the early innings and we're willing to go as early as you know, series seed. Uh, for the right person, we would maybe, maybe even do a Genesis type deal, uh, right, right people. Um, so. Uh, and then in terms of stage, we could go as far as a later stage, series A, B, or even C or later, uh, again, depending on the opportunity. So we don't try to limit ourselves uh, to stage so much, although our strength is the early innings. Um, in terms of check size, uh, the sweet spot for us today for a first check is perhaps in that four to $6 million range. Although we have been also writing checks in very early stage companies uh, at smaller amounts when it's more of a, yeah, that C stage. Very cool. Well, I have a feeling that some of the entrepreneurs watching at home and some of the entrepreneurs participating will love to talk to you after the show. Uh, and we'll talk about how to get in touch with you a little bit later on. Right now, uh, if you're just tuning in, this is once again, BevNet's Elevator Talk live stream. I'm Ray Latif, joined by Tom Spear, the founder and managing partner of Boulder Food Group. He's gonna be offering his uh, perspective as an investor to the entrepreneurs presenting today. Tom, are you ready to go? Ready to hear from our uh, entrepreneurs? I'm excited to hear from everyone. Fantastic. First up is Tobin Ludwig, who is the co-founder and COO of Hella Cocktail. Oh, Tobin, how are you? Tobin, you're, uh, you're muted. <laughs> I'm unmuting. Now I'm, you're unmuted. I'm, well I'm done. Muting. Unmuting. Hey, well, I'm doing great, Ray. Uh, thanks to you and the BevNet community for having Hella Cocktail Co. with you today. And Tom, really nice to connect with you as well. Excited to tell you a little bit about our story. Fantastic. Well, I know your story pretty well. Uh, for folks at home who are not familiar with your story, could you tell us a bit about Hella Cocktail Company? Absolutely. So Hella Cocktail Co. is a minority owned and operated business, a born out of a passion for sharing, 
uh, the three co-founders, uh, myself included, uh, started making cocktail bitters in a mason jar as a hobby way back in 2007. Uh, we identified an early opportunity in the market as the trend for at-home uh, craft cocktailing kind of went on a large upswing. And uh, since, uh, since 2011, when we first became a little company, uh, we ran kind of a uh, um, nights and weekends project hobby for several years before we could take the dive in. Uh, we have developed uh, a number of products, starting with craft cocktail bitters, uh, and then expanded into cocktail mixers, uh, products like Bloody Mary mix and margarita mix that you've, uh, of course, familiar with. And then our most exciting and recent launch years in the making is our bitters and soda which is a category defining uh, entrant in the um, sparkling aperitif, non-alc category. Um, we, uh, as a company, believe in lowering the barrier of entry for craft cocktailing, both for at home and on premise. And we've done uh, uh, our best to create an omni-channel platform and approach um, to connect with as many consumers as possible along uh, what we call our engagement curve. So from craft cocktail bitters, to Bloody Mary mix, to uh, bitters and soda. Um, we connect with a lot of consumers in a lot of different places. Awesome. Uh, talk a little bit about your distribution and retail footprint. At this, where, where is Hella sold at this point? Absolutely. So an interesting thing about our product makeup is we appeal to a lot of different retail types. On the conventional side, um, we... Um, we work with uh, a number of, of retail brands in varying capacities. Um, conventional would be, a, we're doing a pilot with Walmart right now in the Northeast, um, which is exciting. And they're taking our cocktail mixers, right? Kind of a lower barrier of entry, like our Bloody Mary mix, great for that consumer. Um, uh, and then we're also doing quite a bit in the natural channel. Um, uh, Whole Foods would be a great example of that. Uh, and they took our bitters and soda national beginning of, uh, let's see, in May, we started rolling out with them. So we've been about six weeks so far uh, with Whole Foods. Uh, New Seasons is another participant in the natural channel. Um, and uh, the, the, the retail footprint for us, I think there's a huge opportunity there to grow and our distribution ends up uh, Kehi, UNFI, a lot of the big players. Uh, and then an interesting thing because of our product type, we also do quite a bit in liquor and wine retail as well. Total Wine and More would be one of our most notable uh, national retail partners there. Uh, and we're distributed uh, through a variety of uh, uh, wine and liquor distributors, Southern Glazers being the most notable example. Thanks, Tom. Yeah. 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 I've been lucky to have uh, have your product before, and, and it's the, the flavors are, are really wonderful. Um, I haven't tried the newer innovation yet, but uh, you know, definitely am familiar with, with the brand and the product. Can, do you mind whatever you're comfortable sharing? You, can you give us a bit of an update on where you are in terms of the progress of the business, in terms of just you know, you know, just revenue and any of things like that? Yeah, absolutely. So. Obviously, I think all of us, and you, you uh, noted this in, in, in your intro, uh, COVID-19 has um, dramatically disrupted um, everybody in a variety of capacities. Uh, if you look at um, the ecosystem uh, uh, where our products exist, um, one of our biggest channels was um, on-premise. Um, one of our biggest single customers was Delta Airlines. Uh, we were the preferred cocktail, remain the preferred cocktail supplier to Delta. Right now, they are no longer serving our products on board the aircraft. What's um, uh, TGI Fridays was another on-premise example. What we were able to do actually is um, pivot um, and channel all of that lost business at this point into a, a dramatic bolstering of e-commerce and these new uh, retail opportunities as well have, have supported. So uh, uh, year to date, we're at uh, 1.28 uh, million approximately. Um, and uh, that's actually more or less in line with the last 12 years, same period. Um, so we've made up a dramatic difference from, uh, I think Delta last year, the same period was doing about a quarter million of that for us. Um, we're looking at this year before COVID, we were projecting uh, five and a half to six. 
Um, right now, uh, things are happening so quickly, it's, it's hard to say. Uh, we're probably going to miss our projections, if I can be completely blunt with you. Um, and I think we're not the only um, the company that's subjected to uh, readjusting expectations. Um, but where we are seeing um, uh, a huge opportunity is with new retail partners like Whole Foods um, and without field marketing, you know, our entire marketing approach with um, our entire product line has always been field marketing has always been kind of our most successful path to market, get the product in front of consumers. With no, with no marketing and no field marketing, right now we're doing um, uh, over uh, one unit per store per week with Whole Foods, which for the first few weeks of business, we're happy and the trend is going in the right direction. Uh, so once we push some marketing behind it, I think there's really a big opportunity. Uh, and hopefully, I think a big question for everyone is when is field marketing gonna be actually a viable good decision again? Um, we don't know. Um, We'll find out. So um, Amazon, I think, is worth noting. Um, we're projected to do about a million alone on Amazon uh, this year. Um, uh, and that's up. Um, oh, I want to say we did about 100 to 150 last year in total. So um, a very large increase there. Luckily, we were well positioned to pivot when, um, when the world kind of got flipped upside down. Yeah. You know Clearly, you're not the only ones that are dealing with uh, changes in the plans for the year. Uh, so appreciate the update on that front. And uh, I do feel like you're in a great spot in general. And I love the, the shift towards some of the not out stuff. Uh, it would be really interesting to see in the United States in particular uh, where that goes, given what happened, what, where the category is in Europe. There's obviously a lot of potential uh, for that opportunity should we start to look a bit more like Europe, which I think... Maybe we may not get fully to, to where they are in terms of percentages, but I think we're going to get a lot further from where we are today. People are going to take this seriously. Cool. Yeah. The, um, the non-ALK uh, and I would say sober curious movement is uh, really an, an interesting new category that is um, attracting a lot of really interesting, cool young brands uh, and the bitters and soda we think fits really nicely in that, in that segment. So yeah, we'll, we'll see where it goes for sure. Terrific. Tom, we got about 30 seconds left, but I'm curious, uh, I'd love to get your thoughts on what do you think the bigger opportunity is for Hella? Is it in their mixer line, their bitter line or their ready to drink products? I like the holistic approach. Uh, you know, I really, I really do. If you can have that virtuous circle and continue to interrupt consumers' lives and be a trusted source for as an alcoholic-based mixer, or be the, the type of product that makes a, a soda water really differentiated and unique, and the type of you know non-alcoholic drink you might have if you're deciding not to drink alcohol. So I do like the, the broad approach in terms of the biggest opportunity. Um, I, I don't know. I, I think it, part of the challenge today is that the categories are still relatively small in this country, though the growth rates are really healthy. And uh, we'll love to see which segments grow the fastest and st before they start to level off. Uh, but I, I like your approach of being broad and trying to go after each of the opportunities with what I think is a solid brand. Fantastic. Tobin, thank you so much for joining us on the live stream. Good luck with everything going forward and uh, great to see you as, as always. Ray, great to see you too. Thank you. And Tom, great to speak to you. Thank Kill you. it, everybody. See ya. See ya. Great stuff from Tobin Ludwig of Hella Cocktail Co. Uh, let's move on to our next guest at the live stream. That's Griffin Spolansky, who is the partner and CEO with Mezcla. Griffin, how are you? Ray, Tom, thank you very much for having me on. Thank you so much for joining us. Mezcla, a relatively new brand. Uh, tell us about yourselves. Yeah, very new, actually. We launched next week, uh, which is pretty <laughs> exciting. <laughs> so you caught us at a good time. But Mezcla means mixture in Spanish. And we're a vegan, non-GMO, gluten-free protein bar um, that actually celebrates the world's diversity through food and art. So what we're doing is we're sourcing ingredients from all over the world. And we're calling those ingredients out on our wrappers. So, for example, we source our matcha from Japan. And we have a Japanese matcha vanilla flavor. We source Chipotle from Mexico, and we have a Mexican Chipotle hot chocolate flavor. And uh, we source our cocoa from Peru and have a Peruvian cocoa peanut butter flavor. Um, so that's really our angle with the food. 
And look, there are a lot of good tasting protein bars out there. There are a lot of functional protein bars out there, but we're trying to do that and also focus on the food as well. Where do we get the food? What's the story behind the food? You know, eating is a very sensory experience and we're really trying to deliver that to the customer. So that's the first piece of the puzzle. And then the next piece of the puzzle is the art piece. So we actually have an artist from each of these countries that's designed the art on our wrappers. So I'll show you guys a little image of it now, but this is done by Saki Murakami. She's an artist from Tokyo. And uh, we have an artist from uh, Mexico and an artist from Peru as well that did those wrappers. Um, so we have art that adorns the wrappers. And then finally, we actually have a QR code on the front of our wrappers. And when you scan that code, you can see a different piece of user generated art every day. And the whole idea is to really engage the consumer here and to peel back a layer and go deeper um, with the consumer than just offering a bar that they eat, throw out and forget about. Um, and I guess the last piece that I will mention is, you know, we're a community driven bar. So we're giving back 2% of our profits in the form of art supplies to schools in need. Uh, and we're all about fostering this community, you know, highlighting people, highlighting food, and just being a company that really is different in a pretty saturated space. Launching next week, uh, that is very new. Uh, are you gonna be sold in any particular retailer? Or are you going direct to consumer at, at launch? Good question. So uh, we're launching in 625 Walmart stores uh, next week, which is really exciting for us. And uh, then we launch e-commerce direct to consumer uh, end of July, early August. Wow, sounds like you're off to a great start. Uh, Tom, interested to get your thoughts. I mean, the protein bar category is pretty saturated at this point. You know, what do you think of Mezcla's uh, approach to uh, sort of breaking through the clutter? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting time to be entering the category. I, maybe you said it and I missed it. This is a shelf stable bar, not a refrigerator bar, correct? Okay. Uh, yeah, I think, you know, whether we're talking about refrigerated or shelf stable bars, it is an interesting time to be joining the category because the category has come under a lot of pressure during COVID. As everyone knows, the consumers are spending a lot more time at home and on the go convenience is uh, is definitely under pressure just because consumers aren't on the go. Or so uh, I think you know there's you're at a we're at a baseline or a floor in terms of where this category is going to come back from. Uh, the question is, you know, will you be a long term participant in the category? I think that you know starting with 600 WalMarts is a really terrific test and a, a very strong start. So I would be very focused on nurturing the core and not going too far too fast uh, because you know all, there's a lot of really strong bar businesses that are wanting to you know make sure these consumers when they are shopping the category are coming to them. So I, I have a bunch of questions about price, uh, about size, uh, things of that nature. And I'd be curious, uh, I guess on price, what, what is the price point you're gonna be at at Walmart? Yes, yeah, so we're priced at Walmart at 246 right now, uh, which is about 10% higher than our closest competitor. Um, and Tom, one thing to your point as well, we're very focused on our e-commerce experience. Obviously the world is changing quite quickly and we understand that. So we're actually offering a subscription online, an eight bar subscription, 1999 uh, to buy our box. And essentially, you know, we're really trying to drive a unique customer experience online because to your point, one, extremely, extremely difficult to stand out on shelves. And two, you know, customer habits are changing with shopping. So what we're trying to do is really outside of Walmart, not focus too much on retail and really focus on our online sales as well to make sure that, you know, we have a thriving business, brick and mortar, but also a really thriving business e-com. And ju just on the e-com side, so, so I'm aware and all the, the viewers watching are aware, what is your website, your domain name? Yeah, so it's EAT, e -A -T, and then Mezcla, M-E-Z-C-L-A. Perfect. And we okay. haven't launched that site yet. So we have a landing page up now and that site launches, depending on how quickly our designers work, uh, end of July, early August. Sounds like you're going to have a very busy summer. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. And how about, so just, in, I want to ask a question about the name too, um, and just, you know, take this the right way. I just, I think in th these times, we have to be especially sensitive to, to, to brand names and how that's, you know, people are thinking about that from a cultural standpoint. Um, you know, you know, do you, are, from a heritage standpoint, authenticity, um, I mean, do you have, uh, are you, to Spanish descent or is there kind of any tie back to you personally on that? Yeah. So I'm really glad you actually asked that question. So I started the company with a lady named Coco Sotelo. She actually immigrated from Mexico 16 years ago and that's where the name Mezco was born. So we met while I was in a social entrepreneurship course at UVA. And, you know, when she came to America, she felt lost and she felt like she really found her voice through food. So we actually developed a really strong friendship and started making test bars in her kitchen 
that did not go over very well. They, you know, they turned out good, but a week later they would go bad. Um, so then we, you know, obviously moved to a commercial kitchen and then a co-packer, but uh, we came up with the name together and it was kind of an homage to, uh, to her roots. So I'm she, glad you asked that question. Your co-founder essentially and still, yeah, she's, still very much part of the business. And... Yeah, good question. So she's a partner now and she, uh, she advises us and uh, we actually have a call tonight. So uh, she's definitely very much a part of the business. Yeah, I, I just think it's important to make sure that message is loud and clear out there that, you know, the kind of the roots of the, the, the concept and brand are kind of buried in something that's that, that makes a bit of sense and it doesn't offend folks, which I think, you know, clearly happening a lot. Mm -hmm. I know for sure. You definitely have to be very careful about that these days. Yeah. Uh, interesting brand story, uh, really amazing standout packaging. Um, at the end of the day, people are eating the bars because of the nutrition that the bars offer, right? So, um, you know, how do you balance that as an investor? How do you think about that, Tom? And how would you think about that in, in Nesla's case? You know, again, brand story, packaging, both, both great and both interesting. At the end of the day, once again, it's, it's, it's food. Yeah, you know, the, the bar category is re remarkable. You know, go back a few decades and the category started to, you know, come to life and be, be a category. And it's reinvented itself, you know, a few times. And I do think as time goes on, it'll continue to, to develop and there's going to be new winners in the category, even though it's really competitive. So we're, you know, we're in the category with three different investments, one on the shelf stable side, two on the, on the refrigerated side. And so we're believers. Uh, I'm believers that I'm a personal believer that the category is going to, going to be relevant for a long time. It's obviously at a, it's a tough spot right now, but it all comes down to performance at shelf. So as an investor, I'm going to be really focused on what you do for the next couple quarters. You know, and we'll, we'll caveat everything with the notion that, you know, consumers are not really in stores, but it's really all about performance on shelf. I mean, how, how do you perform against Kind Bar? How do you perform against these bars that are really, really powerful, Cliff and Kind, you know, most notably? We got about 30 seconds left, but uh, you know, one thing uh, you didn't mention Griffin was your Kickstarter campaign. You guys raised about over $30,000 on Kickstarter. Uh, how relevant is something like that uh, to you as an investor, Tom? Uh, in and of itself, it's not necessarily relevant it, as long as it's organized properly and it doesn't make a cap table really uh, crowded with lots of individual names and you know, can create a lot of complication when you're trying to get document signed and things of that nature. So as, if it's done the right way, it's okay. Um, I, it can deliver amazing results for, for uh, young companies. So I definitely see the need for it in the market and I'm supportive of it, uh, but it needs to be organized the right way from a you know, documentation and corporate perspective. Fantastic. Well, you know, Griffin, really interesting to hear about your brand. Uh, thanks so much for taking the time to be with us on the live stream and uh, please stay in touch. Absolutely. Ray, Tom, thank you guys very much. Appreciate it. All right. And just send some samples. Absolutely. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> I will, for sure. Have a good one, guys. Perfect. Good stuff. Well, Tom, you know, if, if folks do want to send you samples, how do they get in touch with you? Uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks for asking. So uh, the best way is probably to email us. Uh, if you could email our, our, our partners at dealteam at bfgpartners.com. So that's D-E-A-L-T-E-A-M. Uh, the deal team. And so, yeah, if you just send us a note, we'd happily send you our, our address and then, uh, you know, we'd love to start a relationship. Don't send samples unless uh, you've heard from the uh, deal team, correct? Uh, it's probably best just so, you know, right now, especially we, it's hard to coordinate samples. So just to send them to our office is probably not the best idea, especially if it's a, a shelf state or a refrigerated type product or frozen product. That's, that could be a problem. So the deal team, uh, I didn't ask this earlier, how many deals would you say you make a year? Oh, yeah, so it's a great question. And uh, historically we've made two to three new investments a year and we're also supporting our existing portfolio. So the number of deals we're doing a year is substantially greater than two or three. I would say in the next couple of years with COVID uh, happening, uh, we're likely to make a few more than that, probably earlier stage investments more than a later stage, but we're seeing a ton of a really amazing innovation right now from young entrepreneurs. So I would, you know, I'd, I'd see us probably making, you know, a handful more seed investments, hopefully three to five per year over the next couple of years. 
and then uh, you know we find the right opportunity. We'd love to take a swing at something bigger, but um, you know we're we're obviously going to be patient. All right, well, stay tuned on Bevnet and Nosh for any announcements of those deals. All of them are made public, right? Yeah, and usually, you know, we're, we're lucky to have a great relationship with, with you all, and we love uh, sharing the news with the world, you know, with, with uh, BevNet or NOSH or one of your sister organizations. We love sharing it as well. All right, for folks just tuning in, you're watching BevNet's Elevator Talk live stream. I'm Ray Latif, joined by Tom Spear, the founder and managing partner of Boulder Food Group. Let's talk to our next entrepreneur, who is Chris Harper, the founder of Chase. Chris, how are you? I am excellent. Thanks for having <laughs> me, Ray. Th nice to meet you, Tom. Uh, what's going on, guys? How are you, Ray and Tom? We're doing good. I'm doing good. Tom, how are you? I'm doing wonderful. Thank you. Fantastic. Awesome. Chase is the name of the brand. What do you guys do? Chase, what do we do? Chase is a zero calorie cocktail mixer loaded with nine B vitamins to combat your hangover. We're keto friendly, no artificial colors or flavors, and we're the only cocktail mixer in this unique compact bottle uh, that has 30 servings. You can take it with you everywhere. The plane, as we say, take chase wherever life takes you. I like it. Uh, how long has it been in development? How long have you guys been in the market? So we launched two years ago. We launched in 2018 and we came out of Toronto, Canada. I started making the product with my own two hands and started cold calling on all health food stores across Toronto. Um, and then we eventually moved to co-packing and co-manufacturing. And in our first seven months, we got a nationwide deal in Canada with GNC and we did a full list on the till. Um, we're on the till in every location across Canada. And uh, we have a huge online play. We've partnered with one of the top e-commerce experts in the industry. And uh, the, the next exciting thing is uh, we're coming out with two new flavors. We've got currently two flavors, delicious flavors, pineapple mango and cola. It tastes just like Coca-Cola, but without all the bad ingredients. And uh, to kind of wrap it up here, Ray, we're we're launching in the United States over the next six to 12 months in a massive way, going in some of the largest retailers in the world. So it's very exciting. Everything's moving according to plan. Very cool. On the till, now I love Canada, I love Canadians. But yeah. I, don't think, I, I think uh, some folks might not know what you mean by on the till. What does on the till mean? Oh, on the till. Sorry for using the industry lingo, everyone. On the till means right on the checkout counter. So typically where you find packs of gum, maybe an Archie comic or any kind of magazines. Um, all the, we're open to going into certain aisles, but the till has really been crucial for us as it's a great basket add-on item for people. Are you sold in liquor stores too? I would think that being on the till in a liquor store might be a, a good spot for you guys. So in Canada, the government controls liquor distribution um, and they don't allow you to sell non-liquor products in liquor stores. Um, but that's not to say that we don't have some exciting stuff coming up in the United States liquor stores. Interesting stuff. Yeah. Tom, uh, you know, hangover recovery uh, has been around for some time in various forms. Um, you know, what are your thoughts on the, uh, on the I'll call it a, a segment or a category and, and how Chase is approaching that market? Yeah, the, the, you know, I think the hangover market specifically certainly, you know, has been attacked from a few different angles. I think some companies are finding some nice success today. Um, my partner, who's not on the call today, obviously, but exceptionally uh, thoughtful person, launched a, a hangover drink called Function, which some folks on this call may remember. And so as a firm, we have real deep experience in this area and know some of the, you know, ups and potential ups and downs. Um, in terms of your distribution strategy, obviously being at the register is fabulous or at, on the till as, as, as it were, but uh, it's hard to build a business rollout strategy around it because that space is so hard to come by. And can, you know, when you do get it, it can be really expensive and there's a lot of competition for it. So it's really hard to build a plan around it. I'm curious, you know, how, how does that affect your, your rollout plans? I think we may have lost you. Did we Fuck. lose Chris? I think we did. Oh, bummer. Well, question I didn't think was that that tough, but no, no. I, I let's see. I think he's coming back shortly. Uh, your partner being Dayton Miller is that is that who you're talking about? Who uh, is the fact? Right, yeah. Yeah, function a really interesting brand. Um, it's sort of making a comeback now, isn't it? Yeah, it's I, it's still still out there. It's you know different format than than uh, Chase your your drink. It's um, 
you know, that was really more of a full ready to drink product in a PT. And I, I do like the format of chase your drink. It definitely reminds me of the craft concept Mio or Mayo, Mio. Mio. Um, yep. You know, yeah. Sorry, which, guys. I don't know the exact numbers, but I, I do believe that they've been really successful in that format. So um, I, I like the fact that you're going after a, a format that's compact, uh, can fit on shelf in a lot of different areas and uh, a lot of different ways. Chris, we lost you there for a second. Uh, the, yeah. the advice and feedback Tom gave was so invaluable, but unfortunately we don't have time to go back and review it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> we, <laughs> we, we filled in with some, some discussion about function, but um, Tom, did you have any more questions or did you want to uh, get any more clarification about how you get on uh, in front of that? Strategy. That's what the question was. I don't think go, you know, planning to roll out to registers is a good strategy because it's too hard to get us to register. You know, you need a dedicated part of the store where there's bigger shelf sets. And how are you thinking about that in the U.S.? Yeah, so absolutely. We've discussed the till. The till for us in Canada was pretty easy for the most part, uh, to be completely honest with you, because we were offering a new, unique till product that they hadn't seen before. Um, and especially with uh, some of our online marketing that we do that really separates the brand. But in large U.S. retailers, the ones we'll be launching in, we are going to go into their aisle uh, a lot of them into the aisles, the drink sections or the cocktail mixer sections where the rest of the uh, mixes are. Um, but regardless for us, we have a, and I did hear the former entrepreneur talk about traditional field marketing um, and things like that with COVID and everything. And one thing we've done, Tom and Ray, that's really uh, separated us from other brands is I have a background in technology. So we've been running hyper-targeted ads that target people that live within a 10 mile radius of the locations. We let those people know that our product is now in the store with a, a nice look and picture and a nice ad copy, it drives foot traffic into the store, increases sell through wonderfully, and you don't have to do a single sampling or a field marketing team to create awareness in localized environments. So it's a very cost-effective strategy, and it's a very effective strategy. Our sell through in Canada has been phenomenal as we've executed on this during COVID-19. Are the markets comparable, Tom? I mean, have you seen brands that have done well in Canada do well in the States or vice versa? For sure. There's definitely a, a carryover between the two countries. And, uh, you know, the conventional wisdom is that Canada can be approximately 10% of the volume of the United States. Certain er certain categories or products probably can outperform that. Uh, so, yeah, if, if something's working well in Canada, I think it absolutely is relevant to the U.S. market. One of the other things that uh, COVID has uh, really hit hard are bars and restaurants. Um, and I wonder if, you know, after a long night out, people would reach, reach for Chase, but now there's no long night out to be had unless you're doing it at home. Do you think that affects, um, you know, sales or, you know, Chris, I mean, have you, has that factored into your, you know, business strategy for the next year or two? Uh, no, absolutely not. So just to get something uh, clear on what Chase is, first and foremost, we're a cocktail mixer. Secondary, we have vitamins in it to combat a hangover. But what we really made was a, a healthy cocktail mixer where you could go and not increase your calories, have a bunch of Coca-Cola, so you can enjoy a night out. So it's not a hangover remedy. We're not saying put this in your drink after you went out and had one too many uh, gin and tonics. What we're saying is drink this while you're drinking. And just to also clarify on that point, we've kind of stayed back from food service because our online has been so strong and our retail is growing so rapidly. We're projecting to do over $72 million in 2021, uh, quite swimmingly with our online and retail. So with what's going on right now, we don't want to overreach into food service because we're very focused on retail and e-commerce across the world. And to uh, Tom, um, we tested the United States before we even called uh, any of these major retailers by going in with an online ad strategy and seeing what the uptick was on e-commerce before uh, going into retail so that we can validate without any level of uncertainty that our sell-through will be incredible. Out of curiosity, what, what is, uh, in Canada, what, if you're willing to share, what is the current revenue out of, out of uh, Canada? Tom, you and I can talk about that separately on a phone call if you'd like, but I'm, I'm not going to, we're a private company and I'll exercise my private company rights right now. <laughs> okay. Well, Chris, thank you very much for uh, joining us on the live stream. Uh, hopefully you and Tom can chat a little bit later on, but uh, yeah, please stay in touch going forward. Absolute pleasure, guys. I mean it. And if anyone's watching this, this is an incredible platform. Tune into their podcast. Raise the man. Tom, also absolute pleasure meeting you. And I'm excited to hear the other entrepreneurs, guys. Fantastic. Thank you so much again, Chris. See you guys. Thanks, Chris.
See you, Tom. All right, uh, moving on to our next guest of this edition of BevNet's Elevator Talk live stream. That's Stuart Dimson, the CEO and co-founder of Dr. D. Stuart, how are you? I'm doing great. Thanks, Ray. Nice to see you, Tom. Hi, Stuart. Stuart, great, great. Stuart, Stuart is Dr. D himself. Uh, his uh, image used to be on every single bottle of, uh, of Dr. D's, but you have a new, uh, you have a new format. For the, for the yes, beverages. indeed. Yeah. Uh, Doctor D is still there. He's just, you know, a little smaller up in okay. the up in the top there. That's right. Tell us a bit um, about this uh, new uh, this decision to uh, launch in cans. Yeah, we're super excited about our new launch into the cans. Um, we were looking to lower our carbon footprint. We do a lot of uh, sales in the southeast. Spent a lot of time down there doing field marketing over the last two years. And it was very discouraging to hear that the majority of our units were winding up going to the landfills. Uh, glass is not being recycled much anymore in the greater United States. It's a bit of a blind spot out there uh, in the recycling world. Uh, glass bottles, they have absolutely no uh, recycled material in them. It's all virgin glass. Uh, the aluminum can has uh, generally around 70% recycled material. Um, so, you know, we are making a live fermented probiotic drink. We consider it one of the most functional beverages, uh, soft drinks on the market uh, because we have electrolytes, amino acids, B vitamins, as well as the probiotics. So we wanted to represent the product in a uh, more healthy for the environment container that would match the what we are giving the health of what's inside the can for your body. So we feel that this new packaging really brings us into alignment with uh, the mission of the drink, uh, what we're providing to the individual, as well as what we're going to be offering to the, the world community uh, in sustainability. Sparkling probiotic drink. Uh, how long have you guys been around? Because I, I remember Dr. D's, I think it was my first Expo West or maybe second or third one. When did you guys launch? We launched in uh, 2014. Um, we went into uh, the Rocky Mountain region of Whole Foods. We also uh, went on shelf with natural grocers at that time. Um, so we have, we're, we are a small uh, family run company in Louisville, Colorado. So we're right next door to Tom, um, next town over. And um, we have been focusing on bringing these products to the market in a vertically integrated way. We own the entire process. So, um, you know, we turned our bottling line into the canning line. It's all in-house. We do all our own fermentation so that we control the process start to finish. What do you think of that vertically integrated approach, Tom? I mean, does that, uh, do you think that's, as an investor, do you think that's something that um, is, uh, uh, a bonus or a positive for a brand, or would you rather see the, the brand owner focus on sales and marketing and less on production? No, th there are really no absolutes on this. Uh, either path is acceptable for us. Uh, most of our partners do use third parties when there is quality capacity out there for the product you're trying to make, and they can meet the product specs and they can have enough of a supply chain in order to meet the demand. Uh, that does allow the business to focus on sales and marketing, which is a nice attribute and not be, you know, stuck in the, the mire of having to figure out operations and quality and, and all the detail that goes into to making products. However, uh, margin is incredibly important. If having a vertically integrated operation gives you the margins you need to compete in a really competitive category and still scale the way that the market demands, I think it's acceptable, uh, but that scaling is the toughest part. And, you know, adding a, a new large customer like a, a Walmart or a, a Target, Whole Foods, a, a Costco, you, you name any of the big ones, Kroger, um, that could be tough in a self-manufacturing environment to, to add on a really big customer. So, but I, I, in general, if it can deliver a strong margin, I think it can be really exciting. We've seen a bunch of new entries into the market uh, focused on sort of this gut health focused soft drink. And it's interesting, you know, uh, Stuart, that you called it a soft drink. Um, is, 
what are you thinking about the competitive landscape right now? I mean, and Tom, I'm curious to hear your thoughts too, as we're starting to see more uh, better for you probiotic, prebiotic drinks come to market, all really focused on this, this idea of better gut health uh, in the form of a soft drink. Well, for us, it's very important that we're trying to differentiate ourselves from kombucha right now. Um, we, we're fans of kombucha, but uh, Dr. D's is a water kefir. Uh, kombucha operates on the upper GI, helps you digest food. Our product is more of a probiotic supplement that's focused in on the lower GI, help you absorb the nutrients from your food. Um, and we feel that that's important for people to understand because there's a lot of confusion there. And because of that, our probiotic strains that we're using do not have the heavy vinegar-like flavors that are found in the kombuchas. So we need to inform our consumer that this product tastes amazing um, and is more focused for that, that lower GI. Uh, we never use powdered probiotics in the product either. It's entirely live fermented. We have over 25 different strains of the lactobacillus probiotic in our drink. And that natural live fermentation process is where you get the amino acids, the B vitamins, uh, electrolytes are part of uh, what we feed to the microorganisms. So it's, it's a very functional uh, full spectrum drink. And uh, we feel that this beverage is what a lot of people on the market are looking for when they're thinking of a probiotic drink. And Tom, I mean, again, you know, the, the landscape for this gut health beverage category is evolving. Um, and it isn't just kombucha, as Stuart indicated. Um, you know, wh what are your thoughts on the evolution of that space and, you know, how Dr. D's is approaching it? Yeah, I, I like the adjustments you're making. I really like the fact that you've gone to aluminum. The glass historically has been pretty sustainable in the whole world of of uh, ready to drink beverages, but I think aluminum is a step even further in the right direction. So I commend you for that. The category is not going away. This is people are going to think about wellness and think about the ability to drink uh, products that help to deliver on their wellness goals. And I think you're super relevant for a long time to come. Uh, it is going to be a really competitive dogfight. I think we all know that. There's some, you know, big players already in the space that, that we're all familiar with. There's a lot of young upstarts and uh, everyone's going after generally the same type of consumer. So, um, I, you know, you, you've been in the business a while. You, you know the, the, some of the ups and downs, of course. And, uh, you know, the fact that you've been at it a while, I think gives you a bit of an advantage. So it's still going to be tough. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I really appreciate that. Thanks for, uh, you know, the... Uh, going to aluminum was a big jump for us. It, you know, there was a lot of unknowns. Um, our one of our largest um, customers right now is Publix in the southeast, and they were willing to uh, allow us to jump into this. And it's interesting to see some of the bigger players are also starting to move to either aluminum cans or aluminum bottles. Um, so. That, that is something that uh, is nice to see. We're all moving towards more sustainability. Um, and, and one of the things we really try and point out when we are pitching is that we're trying to bring more people into this category. There are so many people out there that we encounter who have had bad experiences with some of the beverages that are a little more on the sour vinegary side. And uh, generally when they hear that we are not like that, they're willing to take a try. They, they uh, you know, especially our Concord grape is our number one seller. Uh, even had a gentleman from Welch's give me a compliment on that, which I really took to heart. Um, it's the original flavor that I made right here in my kitchen. Um, so very excited to see that the, the traction that we've gotten out of that. Because people are really looking for something that, that tastes great. We, we believe strongly that things can taste great and be good for you and can be done with very simple, very clean ingredients. Um, so we're, we're really proud of the drinks and I appreciate the feedback. Well, I can certainly attest to the drinks tasting great. Uh, I remember them again from the first time I tried them back at Expo West. Uh, Stuart, great job with the formulation and a great job with the new package. It looks great. We have, uh, we had some in our cooler at BevNet. Uh, I took awesome. a couple home, but they are long gone. So I uh, <laughs> hope to see them in my neck of the woods uh, at some point. 
they're coming. We've we've launched our online uh, store as well. Uh, we just launched on Amazon, and uh, we'll be getting into some stores near you. So really appreciate that. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks so much for joining All us right. on the live stream. And uh, yeah, please stay in touch. Will do. All right. Thanks, guys. All right. Tom, as you mentioned, uh, you know, uh, BFG Boulder Food Group is an investor in uh, Olipop. Um, you know, do you invest in brands in more than one category? Would you consider it? I'm sorry, do you, would you invest in, I think I, I, I miss, uh, misspoke there. Would you consider, I think you knew that what, the, the answer, what the question was, would you consider investing uh, in more than one brand in a particular category? We would, yes, but it would have to be differentiated enough so there was, you know, some, you know, they weren't, you know, just smashing into each other head to head. Uh, you know, I mentioned that we're in two investments in the refrigerated bar space. Uh, you know, we feel like those products are different enough that, um, you know, it was acceptable for us to do that. Uh, you know, generally we try to be the very best partners we can be um, and, and not put companies in competition with one another. You know, sometimes, you know, we're almost, it's almost out of our control too. If a certain company wants to launch innovation, another company wants to launch innovation and they end up head to head, uh, that can happen also. So even if we put our best efforts into it, sometimes it doesn't work like we hoped, um, but we want to keep our options open and uh, still be great partners along the way. Well, as long as the category is growing, right? It's probably good for both brands. Yeah, again, unless it's really, you know, it's so similar that it's uncomfortable. For sure, for sure. All right, on to our final guest of BevNet's Elevator Talk live stream, or this episode of the live stream. That's Dan Levinson, the founder, food scientist, and director of operations for Vival Energy Tea. Dan, how are you? I'm great. How are you guys doing? I'm doing great. You know, when I, fought, I saw a food scientist, uh, I, I was pretty interested because we don't have a lot of founders that are food scientists, to my knowledge, or I haven't talked to many. And then I saw the periodic table over your right shoulder. <laughs> and I was like, okay, all right, this guy definitely knows his stuff. <laughs> uh, tell us, or I assume you do, because you have. A, I, I don't know if any people, I don't have a periodic table behind me uh, in my <laughs> So that's just at a glance. I, I right. actually always wanted to have one, not just uh, to get one, but I got one free from American Chemical Society that I'm a member of, so. Came in the mail, figured I'd put it up. <laughs> was it already framed? No, I had an extra frame. Okay, nice. See, that's the way to go. That's how you know you're serious. If you frame the periodic table. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm sorry for being a nut. Uh, it's hot. So Vivo so, Energy T, uh, tell us a little bit about what you guys do. Yeah, so uh, first I want to say I'm a big fan of the show. And thank you guys for having me on. I really appreciate the opportunity. And like you said, I'm a food scientist. And I've been doing product development and commercialization for about 13 years. And I went to University of Massachusetts at Amherst to study food science. And I had a concentration in health and wellness, which is what my personal passion is. So just a little bit about me. I've also always been uh, you know, a big advocate about helping inspire others. And that's what the, the real motivation is behind this drink. So... I think a lot of the times right now, there's more of a conversation around mental health and mental health awareness and really thinking about ways that we can bring the conversation to the table. Sometimes it could just be not getting enough sleep. Sometimes it could be that people aren't necessarily, you know, happy with where they are in life right now. And sometimes you just need a little bit more energy to get you there. And I think it's a lot about balanced energy. So we're really about helping inspire people to follow their dreams and follow their vibes. So Vibe stands for Vibes and Balance. Are you positioning yourself more as an energy drink or as a tea? It's a great question. So I think that as I keep getting asked this question, of course, and it's a great question, and I just kind of stick straight, and my answer is I don't see us as solely either one. And I'm not going to claim to be part of a new category. Uh, there are some other energy teas out there, but I'd say that it's more of a crease in the fold of, you know, the beverage uh, nexus in, in that area. So I know a lot of people think as tea as calming, as a relaxant and lower caffeine, but people also love the other, you know, nutritional benefits of a tea. And 
a lot of people don't like coffee. So as like a coffee alternative, we, we find a nice niche in as energy tea. You have uh, some news to share as well, including uh, a new single server product as well. Tell us a little about that. Yeah, so we basically just, as everyone's been dealing with some COVID-19 related stress from lower foot traffic and retail stores, retail presence, we decided to take a pivot and go to online. So we recently launched an online shop that we're uh, really happy about growing and realizing that direct to consumer, although we hadn't thought about it as a, a good opportunity originally, is more viable than we had thought. And from a margin perspective, it's more beneficial from that, obviously. And also to be able to, you know, be part of someone's regular habit. A lot of the things that we're talking about, about mental health and, you know, being really centered is about having good habits. And the power of habit is monumental, right? In just doing the same positive things multiple times. So being direct to consumer allows us to have some options for subscribe and save, for instance, where we're allowed to, you know, be there for people on a regular basis and, you know, continually have option for people to get product right to them. And we also, like you said, launched a single serve option, which uh, is an uh, it's eight ounce bottle, which we're really excited about. So let me just tell you about the caffeine for a second. So we're a hundred milligrams caffeine per serving, which is about a standard cup of coffee. So it's very easy to communicate that as a coffee alternative. So we're, one of the reasons we're really excited about the eight ounce is it's on the go. Although, as you mentioned, people aren't necessarily on the go as much, but it's just an easier portion size for people to associate with. So it's, you know, a cup of coffee it's equivalent of a serving size. So we're really excited about that as well. Tom, uh, you know, natural energy has been bubbling up uh, for some time right now. Everyone, uh, you know, seeming to sense an opportunity for the broad energy uh, segment, but I uh, haven't seen a lot of brands really succeed in that space. Um, that being said, do you think that the positioning of Viable Energy T is on the right track? Yeah, I guess before I answer that, what's the price point that you're targeting on shelf? Right now we are selling between 379 and 449. Right. Yeah, so expensive for sure. You know, I think that, you know, that, that you know, bringing the price point down is gonna be critical as you get into bigger distribution, just because at that price point, it just is, it's untenable for some, for a lot of consumers and mass market uh, locations. So, uh, I do think consumers are looking for other formats to have, to get their energy. And they're always going to be looking for that. There is a sea of competition out there uh, from, you know, mate type concepts to, to coffee type concepts to tea concepts and then beyond. Uh, so I think that the key part is to really have a very, very tight understanding of your core consumer uh, tight proposition in terms of your price pack architecture and then delivering on taste, you know, is, is going to be crucial. I, I have a taste of the product. I would love to, uh, it looks, looks really delicious. So, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a tough category. It's no doubt about it. It's very competitive, but, uh, there can be winners. There have been some winners in the past and it just will take uh, a lot of work. What do you think of the, the component, the mental health component, uh, that Dan was talking about, you know, how important is that to consumers and how much of them is, is going to really move the needle for consumers, do you think, Tom? Yeah, I, don't, I didn't get the sense that you're talking about nootropics, right? You're not talking about anything on that level of, of stuff. Yeah, so we, we do have nootropics. Um, we have L-theanine, it's amino acid. It stimulates the alpha brain waves, as I'm sure you guys are both aware, and puts you in a more alert, relaxed mindset. Okay. It's actually being tested in... Uh, prescribed a lot by some of the naturopathic doctors as a more natural alternative to some anti-depression medication, anti-anxiety medication. 
and there's a lot of other broad benefits of l dandine so we really like leaning in on that and as we build out our affiliate marketing program which we're working on we've been connecting a lot on social with some mental health advocates as well i like that idea you know get, you know i think a lot of the last few decades has been about spikes ups and downs and ups and downs and hopefully the next few decades for folks are a little bit more consistent and if there are products out there that can deliver a little more consistency in people's daily lives i think that does a lot for for your wellness so uh, i think that's on track and we're also trying to look into the non alkene like we were talking about before we have a couple bars that are non-alcoholic bars and non-alcoholic venues and clubs that we've talked to on earlier on before the COVID situation. So that's obviously slowed down, but we're still in communication with them and they've showed some interest and we're looking forward to offering some options for them for, you know, buying in bulk, of course, to on-premise opportunities there. Just on your online stuff, just make sure it's profitable. Shipping glass is expensive. It looks like you're in glass. So, you know, yeah. obviously, you know, I think that's a good thing relative to, to plastic and, uh, but just make sure it's profitable. Other, you know, it's no fun to sell every product you sell unprofitably. That's, it's a tough road. For sure. Uh, well, Dan, really interesting hearing about uh, Viable Energy Tea. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us. And uh, if you need anything going forward, please stay in touch and let us know. We'll do our best to help. Great. Thank you again for having me on. And uh, I'm more than happy to send you guys some samples so you can try some out. Fantastic. We'll uh, we'll be in touch on on where to ship those uh, a little bit later on. Great. Thanks again. All right. Thank you. All right. Well, Dan from Vibel was our final entrepreneur speaking today. Uh, Tom, you know, really interesting to see all the the variety and diversity of products uh, that are coming to market that are are currently on the market as well. You know, I'm curious to get your thoughts on after hearing these five presentations. You know, what you're most impressed by uh, in terms of uh, you know, how entrepreneurs are tackling uh, white space in the market and, and what they most need help with. Yeah, so I guess I, I leave calls like this or live streams of this nature pretty enthused just because it does show the, the passion of entrepreneurship and, you know, it delivers real results, even in a market that's as tough as it has been for the last couple quarters or quarter and a half. Uh, there's a lot of hustle and a lot of results happening out there from young companies. And when the market turns back in our direction and things starts to get healthier again for certain categories, uh, these, these entrepreneurs are going to benefit. Uh, so I love the fact that, that this type of uh, dialogue is happening. And I, I you know, commend BevNet for pivoting and, and creating a, a safe environment for founders to come talk to folks like you and, 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 and me and others. So, uh, no, I'm really, uh, I, I I, I leave calls like this really, you know, excited that we're going to be able to uh, invest our capital in with some great partners. For sure, me too. I mean, it's an exciting, it's 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 really exciting to see entrepreneurs who really want to make a difference, and you could see that, you know, with with the five folks that we talked to today. Um, you know, I heard you say margin uh, a number of times today. Um, you know, when you're thinking about margin. Uh, you know, what's your best advice for entrepreneurs on, on how to achieve the margin that is going to attract investors like yourself? Yeah, you know, it's there's there's one path that says, you know, we're going to set a market price point at retail that's going to be the price that we sell when we're at scale and we're going to take it on the chin until then. And then there's the other approach that says we're going to make money every time we sell something starting day one. And you know, for me, I, I like the idea of making money day one. If you can, uh, then you're not beholden to your your investors and you're not behind the eight ball if things don't go like you might hope in your planning scenarios. So to the extent the market will allow it and you can sell your products at a really nice profitable level at margins that, you know, make sure that there's enough left to, to really fund ongoing operations. I, I think that's a pretty good strategy. Uh, usually beverage is hard enough and competitive enough at some point, if you really want to grow, that may not work anymore. You're going to have to, you know, you know, you know, probably take some investment and stretch on your more margin a bit till you get there. So, uh, but it's really, you know, situational in terms of those decisions. And I couldn't say one way or the other way is better just by, you know, having a five minute discussion. 
Well, uh, if folks do want to get in touch with you once again, uh, the best way to do, to do so is dealteam at bfgpartners.com. That's right. Yep. Deal team. And one of our six partners will, uh, will get back to you uh, hopefully as promptly as possible. Uh, there's four of us working out of Boulder, Colorado, two out of Los Angeles. Uh, as I mentioned, my partner, Dayton Miller, runs the LA office. And uh, we'd be thrilled to have the opportunity to speak with any of you. Well, as you are, as you noted, you will be making uh, more early stage investments over the next couple of years. So perhaps uh, one of the brands that does send you products uh, in the next month or so will be one that uh, is part of your portfolio going forward. That would be well, awesome. Well, Tom, uh, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. This was fantastic. Really, really appreciate you sharing the feedback and advice with all our entrepreneurs. Uh, I think it's so valuable for you to be uh, you know, an engaged part of our community. So thank you again for that. And thank you to everyone who's watching. Uh, if you're interested in participating in a future episode of BevNet's Elevator Talk live stream, it's pretty simple to do so. Go to bevnet.com slash elevator talk and you can find how to apply. All right, signing off for Tom Spear and our amazing team at BevNet and Nosh. I'm Ray Latif. We'll see you next week on BevNet's Elevator Talk live stream.